My name is Mike Thompson, and I've been dead for three weeks. Now, I know you're wondering just how it is that I'm typing this if I'm dead. Well, let me tell you. I was still wondering how I was walking and talking after the second time I died. Let me tell you what happened, and you'll come to understand. He stood before me in his $1,500 suit, $900 shoes, and a gold Rolex. Hell, his tie probably cost more than my entire outfit. His voice was elevated and his face bright red. I had just finished telling the fat piece of shit exactly what I thought of him. He mistakenly thought that it was his turn to talk. You insignificant little piece of shit. Do you know who you're talking to? Yeah, the fat fuck who's about to get a bullet in his head. Bang. I pulled out a forty-five, leveling it at his face as I said this. I pulled the trigger at the end as if to punctuate the words that I had just spoken. I grabbed a carpet and threw it over his body, stepping up on top of his corpse to access the wall behind him. Arterial spray, brain matter, and bone. These things were just some of the added decor that was now adorning the wall I was approaching. There was only one new addition I was interested in, as I stood on the carpet-covered body of Scarletti, if that was even his real name. My interest was in a small hole. I put away my gun and retrieved my knife. Plunging it into the wall like a slasher film villain attacking his prey, I extracted what I was looking for. The slug which had entered the wall after taking a trip through Scarletti's skull. I was even more pissed now. It wasn't that killing that prick hadn't felt good. In fact, it felt great. I would have loved to have done it 20 more times. No. What pissed me off was the expression on his face. That cocksucker didn't even recognize me. As he stared down the barrel of my forty-five, the look on his face wasn't the one of horror this warranted. It wasn't fear or terror. It certainly wasn't recognition. It was an indignant look that said, You can't do that, I'm too important. No one would ever, could ever, even consider killing him. In Scarletti's defense, no one in their right mind would ever try this. He was, after all, a protected species. This wannabe mobster and self-proclaimed mob boss worked for a very dangerous group. One who would, without a doubt, be coming after me for this transgression. The problem was, I didn't give a shit. He had been there. He had given the order. He had watched the whole thing. He had watched his men kill my wife and children at his request. He had likewise watched them kill me. Yet he showed no signs of recognition. He had no goddamn idea who I was. Next time look at a man before you murder his family, I spat. As much as I would like to hang around and play soccer with his severed head, they would be coming for me soon. It was time to move. The three that were coming for me would eventually know that I pulled the trigger. That's if they didn't already. They would be enraged by the loss of their puppet, which is all he really was. They pulled his strings and he danced. They had put a lot of time into him, however. They molded him into the front man for all their racketeering. Should the guillotine fall, it would have been his head on the chopping block. He wouldn't have dimmed them out if he had to, though. No. He feared a fate at their hands far worse than prison. Besides, they wouldn't have allowed it. And they were powerful enough not to allow it. He had been there to squeeze everything out of life they desired without getting their hands dirty. Not that they minded getting their hands dirty. But they preferred to do that type of thing out of sport rather than necessity. These three could easily have been mistaken for demons. I can promise you they were not from hell. I seriously doubt Satan himself would have wanted anything to do with these self-righteous assholes. Some would think them vampires. Yes, they were pretentious, self-important, and arrogant, but they did not drink blood to survive. They drank it because they got some perverse pleasure out of it. They feasted on human flesh, but they were not zombies or cannibals. To be called cannibals for dining on human flesh would insinuate that they themselves were human, which these three certainly were not. What they were, I have yet to find a name for. They can take on a human appearance, but their true form is much more horrific than that. As for how they would know I did it, they just had a way of knowing things. When they went after someone, their decisions had a certain finality. My family, the victims of murder, and being dead myself, I could care less about their wrath. 
I had nothing to lose. And if it was within my power, I would end these creatures. Unfortunately, I hadn't planned this far. When I woke up in the morgue, having knowledge of Scarletti's responsibilities for the murder of my family, I did the first thing that came to mind. Actually, I found some clothes that fit me, then I did the first thing that popped into my mind. I went home, grabbed my forty-five, and paid a visit to Scarletti. Next thing you know, something popped into his mind, quite literally. With that complete, I was pretty much winging it at this point. I had to find a way to kill these things. Fire. Yes, fire had to be the answer. Fire killed anything. Well, not ghosts, but... Okay, and maybe not demons, and well, okay, fi fire killed most things. So, I would try fire first. Now to track these bastards down. The funny thing is, I suddenly knew exactly where they were. Just like I didn't know how I was alive again without any sign of injury after taking a bullet to the head. And just like I didn't know how I knew where to find Scarletti. I didn't know how I knew where these three were, I just did. And now I was going after them. If only I was that sure of how to kill them. The first one went wildly wrong. I had made a Molotov cocktail even though I had no idea what I was doing. I was, however, confident it would work. Like I said, I was winging it at this point. I watched as he pulled out of the massive gate that led to an even more massive estate. I kept my distance, working things out when I noticed he had his windows down. I sped up and pulled alongside him. When we came to a red light, I lit the makeshift firebomb and chucked it through his passenger side window. The car went up in flames and I drove away laughing like a madman. One and done, I thought. That was before I saw a flaming car pulled up next to me. Son of a... That's as far as I got before I heard gunfire erupt and everything went dark. I woke up and thought I had gone blind, at least until I tried to sit up. I slammed my forehead into a metal ceiling that was way too close to my face. I felt around and realized I was in a cold metal box. I recognized where I was and let out a sigh. Well, shit. I was back in the morgue. I worked my way out and stood up naked and shaking. As I looked to my left, I saw a man in a long white coat holding a clipboard. He just stood there staring at me. Uh, fraternity prank. Sorry, was all I could come up with before I turned and walked out of the room. Once again, I found some clothes, but this time someone saw me first. The police were called, security was alerted, and there was an uproar about the naked man running around the hospital. After I got dressed, I was able to skirt security and got out before the police arrived. Well, that plan ended splendidly well, I told myself as I strolled down the street contemplating my next move. The first thing I needed to do was get mobile again. Praying that my credit cards hadn't been cancelled, I headed to the nearest rental car lot. Luckily, the banks had yet to receive news of my untimely demise. Knowing that my luck might not hold out, I withdrew as much as I could from all accounts, and scheduled a rather large withdrawal for the majority of the balance at the earliest available time. Unfortunately, your standard bank doesn't usually do same-day requests for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I even maxed out the cash withdrawals amounts on all my credit cards. I feared they couldn't do much to me since I was already dead. Come to think of it, I died twice already. Suddenly I had an overwhelming urge to see the look on the investigators' faces. The confusion when they discovered that the corpse of the gunshot victim they had pulled out of the wrecked car was also the missing corpse of the gunshot victim in another case. And, wait for it, the corpse was missing again. I had to pull the car over. I was laughing so hard I had tears running down my face. Yeah, who knew being dead could be so entertaining? Wait till I tell... The thought trailed off abruptly, overcome by another. This time, the tears were not brought on by a fit of laughter. Would I ever get to tell my wife anything again? Would I see her in the afterlife? Would there even be an afterlife for whatever it is that I'd become? God, how I miss her and the girls. A father was supposed to protect his family, and I had failed them. The sadness turned to anger. The anger turned to rage. I sat there on the side of the road, the events of that night replaying in my mind. We had gone out to a movie. The girls wanted to see Despicable Me, a new animated feature film with these little funny talking yellow guys and a supervillain with a pointy nose and an attitude as bad as his luck. When the movie ended, we decided to treat the girls to some ice cream. Although we don't usually allow sweets this late, tonight was kind of special. 
Some investments I had made just paid off big time. We weren't exactly rich, but $970,000 was definitely rich for us. We were celebrating like a family with young children. Favorite family dinner spot, a family-friendly movie, and a special treat before heading home. We were crossing the parking lot to get to the next street, taking a shortcut to the ice cream parlor. That's when a commotion broke out. A man had been running past us when shots rang out, and then the man flew forward doing a face plant. The sound of the shots was deafening, as if coming from right behind us. As I looked back, I discovered that they had come from right behind us. That's when a rather large man in a suit struck me upside my head with the butt of his pistol. My knees became weak and my vision turned white as I fell to the ground. The large man put the barrel of the pistol to the back of my head. My wife pleaded and I begged them to let us go. A man with a voice like a weasel spoke up. I would come to know him as Scarletti. I'm afraid you've seen too much. But we really didn't see anything, I said. He looked me dead in the eye and simply said, Kill them. Before I could react, two men stepped forward and began executing my family. I jumped forward, trying to save them, and then the man behind me pulled the trigger. The next morning, I woke up in the morgue, which is where all of this started. These creatures created Scarletti, sure. He was a piece of shit before they got their hooks into him, but they molded him into a monster. They were responsible for the death of my family, and I would make sure they never harmed anyone else. I wiped the tears from my eyes and pulled back onto the road with no idea where I was going. I decided to get off the highway and turn down what looked like a country road. As if to confirm it, the blacktop gave way to dirt. I saw a for rent sign and turned down a tree-lined drive eventually leading to an old farmhouse. There were two men cleaning the place up and an elderly lady sitting on the porch. I turned off the car and got out to have a look at the place. After getting a look at my surroundings, I approached the woman on the porch. She set down her glass and spoke in a warm, welcoming tone. One that reminded me of my grandmother, inviting me in for some tea. Well, hello there, young man. What can I do for you? I couldn't help but smile before replying. My apologies, ma'am. I saw the for rent sign out front. I hope the place is still available. Just happened to be passing by, huh? She chuckled, then continued to address me with a look that said, I know there's more to you than you let on. It would seem the place is still available. $500 deposit, $500 a month. The boys will be done cleaning in about an hour. It was as if she'd been getting it ready specifically for me. 500 for the whole place? I said, a little puzzled by such a big place at such a low price. Yeah, figure you'll be doing good work. God's work. Don't worry, no one will find you here. Why do you look so surprised, Mr. Thompson? You can call me Mike, please. Wait, how did you know my last name was Thompson? God works in mysterious ways. We'll talk this evening once you're settled in. She tipped me a sly wink, and I somehow knew I could trust her. Still, I couldn't shake the confused state of disbelief, which is odd, to say the least. After all, I had died twice, and here I was. I cautiously approached my house after circling the block a few times. I'm not even sure what I was expecting. There were so many scenarios popping up in my head. Evidently, neither the police nor the bad guys felt the need to stake out my house. I could have just purchased new stuff, which I was still going to anyway. But there were things here that couldn't be purchased. I collected a few pictures and some personal items. I fought the urge to grab my laptop and important documents. The laptop was registered to me, and the documents... Well... I was dead, so what was the point? The pictures, though, I just couldn't let them go. I had risked everything to come here for them. Deciding I had already been here too long, I dropped half the stuff I had collected and took only a handful of items that I felt I must have. I checked the best I could to make sure the coast was clear, then headed back to the rental car. I hadn't seen anyone, not even a neighbor. Probably a good thing. I didn't know if the neighbors knew I was dead. I imagine the slang of my family was on the news where no good tragedy goes to waste. I pulled away from the curb and headed off to do some shopping. By the time I was done and had returned to my new living arrangements, it was still light out. That would not last long, though, and I was expecting company. I hurried in, put stuff away, and started the shower. I felt a lot better having a shower, a shave, and some clean clothes. 
I needed to relax and let my mind clear. After that debacle with the firebomb, I realized I was going about this all wrong. I had been in a hurry with no real plan. If I was going to defeat these guys, I needed to calm down and get focused. The elderly woman, whose name evidently was Tabitha Rose McKinney, walked in shortly after dark and headed straight to the kitchen. I attempted to rise from my chair when she entered, but she quickly gestured for me to remain seated. I don't know why, but I obeyed. When she returned from the kitchen 15 minutes later, she had a plate full of fresh, gooey chocolate chip cookies and some hot tea, which she proclaimed to be Irish breakfast tea. This woman wasted no time, and she certainly got around well enough. But she had to be at least in her 80s. Turns out she was a bit older than that. I admonished myself for not getting her name earlier, and as if reading my mind, she introduced herself and then began speaking. I know this is a lot to take in. Truth be told, you haven't even tried. You've been solely focused on revenge. If you're going to do this, you need to do it to protect the world from these monsters. God has given you another chance, and with it some gifts. I know it doesn't feel much like a second chance without your family, but you'll come to understand in time. Gifts? I question. Yes, like knowing certain things, and coming back when they kill you. Although I'm sure you would rather stay dead, missing your family and all. Life needs balance, and so does the afterlife. These abominations destroy both. Destroying them will help restore that balance. And that will help your family. How does that help my family? They're dead, I said a little more sharply than I meant. I apologize, ma'am. Now, now, there's no need for apologies. Your pain is completely understandable, and please call me Rose. Rose, I said, still feeling a little embarrassed. How does this help my family? The dead can't move on until balance is restored. I'm 117 years old. I've seen this a time or two. Seeing the look on my face, she continued. Like you, I was reborn out of tragedy. A story for another time. Right now, my purpose is to get you on track. You need to understand how important this is. How important you are. We talked for a while, and I came to know her story. Someone had helped her, and now it was her turn. I listened, and I learned. While different beings from different places come to be here when they shouldn't, it throws our world out of balance. When this happens, someone is chosen to restore that balance. These beings are not always the same, and they don't always come from the same places. She couldn't tell me how to kill them or send them back because they were not the same as what she faced and didn't know where they came from. Figuring that out was my job. I also found out that her time was almost up. With me here, she had to go. All part of restoring the damn balance. I found myself already mourning the loss of someone I had just met, who wasn't even gone yet. Although, like me, she had already died, and like me, she was still here. You're not scared? Knowing you're going to die soon, I mean? The balance is important. Besides, I died a long time ago, and I've been ready to move on for a while now. When you've been around this long, you find yourself in a world that no longer makes any sense to you. I'm also hoping to see the people I've missed for so many years. So... We do get to see them again? No, well, that's what I believe. And I've seen enough to suggest it's true. Not all is revealed to us in this life. Faith is often our strongest weapon and our greatest savior. If we knew it wouldn't be faith, would it? I pondered this for a moment before I spoke again. I guess I don't have to agree with it to believe it. That's the spirit, she said with a grin. So, fire doesn't work. Bullets probably don't either. What then in the hell am I supposed to do? Rose had given me a list of things that were known to work in the past, but none of these could end up working on these three. There was silver, glass, salt, amoxicillin, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, cat saliva, and I shit you not, surfboard wax. Some of these would kill anybody, while others were so ridiculous I thought she was having a go at me. There were more on the list, including fire. I'm not trying that again. I decided I needed to trap one so I could try different things, but 
I didn't even know if I could trap one. I rented a van and picked up supplies. Was anyone ever going to tell the credit card companies I was dead? After that, I staked out the mansion belonging to the one I tried to get to before. When he left, I broke in and went to work. I set up all the different items I planned on trying and got a steel cage set up through the door of the bedroom. Now I just had to wait, and when he got there, lure him into the trap. I briefly wondered if I should have hidden an extra set of clothes at the morgue. Then I wondered who the weirdo was that decorated this place. There were sculptures of random body parts. One of an arm, another of a leg. There was a three-foot-tall ear, and the largest was a six-foot-tall sculpture of a nose. The walls were gold paisley, and one room had a purple shag carpet. Maybe he bought this place from a 1970s pimp, I thought, shaking my head. I wandered over to sit where I had a view of the front door. I pulled out a 357 revolver and set it on my lap. If this didn't kill him, it was really going to piss him off. Have you ever tried to get stains out of a shag carpet? Hours went by and I caught myself nodding off a couple times. Then I heard the key slide into the lock of the front door and I was wide awake again. I stood and aimed for the door, attempting to control my breathing. When the door swung open... He didn't even notice me right away. That's good, I thought. Keep coming closer. He finally looked my way and I saw recognition on his face. At least this guy remembered me. He started ranting. You. You set my car on fire. I really liked... I didn't let him finish. Rude, I know, but I had to act before he realized what was coming. The first round just missed his head, tearing an ear off. But the next two went straight through his face. The next three I pumped into his upper torso, finally knocking him off his feet and leaving him flat on his back. He didn't move. Was he dead? Was it that simple? Inhaling the scent of cordite as if it were a smell of victory, I finally allowed my body to relax. Good thing I hadn't popped open some of that expensive champagne I found in his kitchen, because that son of a bitch shot straight up to his feet and let out a long gasp. I could see the bullet wounds healing already, and I thought, okay, this is it. He began to charge, definitely more pissed off than before. I turned and ran, hurling a chair behind me to slow him down. I hit the wall at the T-intersection of the corridor and then took off to my right. There was a door at the end of the hallway. I ran for it harder than I have ever run in my life. I heard him gaining on me as I neared the door. Oh God, please let me make it, I prayed. Apparently he heard me because I made it through the slamming door and shut it behind me just in time. Then I closed and locked the front of the cage and grabbed a lever next to it. I waited. Suddenly the door burst open. I waited till he was in all the way and cranked down the lever. The rear panel dropped into place and I pushed the lever back up and over, locking it. I yanked the lever handle of the mechanism and stepped back as he reached for me through the bars. I brought the handle down hard on his wrist with a sickening crack. That's for my family. And I'm far from done with you. He howled in pain and hurled expletives at me. You think that's bad? Try this. I had nothing, but I was angry and on a roll, so I grabbed the closest thing from the table I'd set up and ended up blasting him in the face with a handful of salt. Ah, it burns! He cried out. Oh, good, it's working. You're done for. I shouted with maniacal laughter as I reached for more salt. What's working? That salt in my eye, you idiot! Oh, um, I thought... What, you'd kill me with salt? Well, try this on for size. I had an electric warmer set up on the table and I grabbed the pan off of it. When he saw it coming, I flung its contents at him. The hell? What is this, hot wax? Hot surfboard wax, actually. Hmm, still nothing. Hmm. Well, it's a bit kinky if that's what you're going for, he snickered. I had left a cup of coffee half drunk on the table and found myself desperately needing some. It was cold, but it was coffee. And it wasn't like I could get out of the room with the cage blocking the door. I took a sip as he started speaking again. This time his tone was much softer. Long day, I feel ya. Listen, maybe we got off on the wrong foot. We seem to have an opening for a position recently vacated by that slimeball Scarletti. You actually did me a favor. I never liked that guy. So how about this? You let me out of here and I make you director of operations. Great pay, excellent benefits. Hell, you could have a place like this. You could have anything you want. I'd had enough and finally turned to face him. 
what I planned to say was something like, what I want is my family back, can you give me that? And hurling something else at him. What ended up happening is me tripping over the pan that was now lying on the floor. My half-empty coffee cup flew out of my hands and struck the bar of the cage, causing it to shatter. The coffee splashed across his face. What came next left me stunned for a moment. Oh shit, that burns. What was that? It's just coffee. Next thing I knew, he dropped to the floor, writhing in pain, the skin on his face melting away. I ran to the window, opened it, and climbed out. I quickly ran to the van and grabbed my thermos. I got to the window, climbed in, falling to the floor rather clumsily. When I reached the cage, he was still holding his face, a stream of obscenities escaping his mouth. Here, hold still, let me rinse you off, I said, pouring the entire thermos on him. The screaming came louder this time as the skin melted away from his head. The skin dripped to the floor like wax until I could see his skull. He gagged, his breath hitching in his chest and then became still. The odor of melting flesh smelled like a body that had been decaying for a week. I had to pull my shirt up over my nose, but it did no good. I finally couldn't take it anymore and retched on the floor, falling to my knees. His grotesque death brought none of the satisfaction I had envisioned, but it meant one less monster in the world. I buried his body in his own backyard. It seemed like the prudent thing to do at the time. I cleaned up the mess, stopping a few times to dry heave. To be honest, I don't think the smell is going away anytime soon. I put everything back in the van and floored it out of there, putting as much distance between me and that house as possible. Now that I was on the road, I had a lot of planning to do, but I also needed rest. Unfortunately, resting might give the other two time I couldn't afford to give them. It was going to be a long night. I finally found a fire extinguisher, the type you could fill up and pressurize yourself. I purchased two of the biggest coffee makers I could find and around 50 pounds of coffee. Returning to the house, I saw Rose sitting on the porch. I waved and began unloading the supplies. That's a lot of coffee. Are you pulling an all-nighter? She said with a smile that I now found comforting. Probably, but that's not what the coffee's for. She gave me a puzzled look for a moment, then something in her eyes changed. She had put the pieces together. Don't tell me. Yep, I'm going to caffeinate them. I shot her a grin, then went inside. Following me in, she had to ask, How in the world did you figure that one out? I tripped and spilled my coffee on one of them. We looked at each other for a moment, then burst out laughing. It felt good to laugh again. And I promised myself if I survived, I would do it more often. Do you have enough coffee filters? Shit, I said, putting my head down and a hand over my face. She started laughing again. She tried to say something, but she was laughing too hard. Finally, she just pointed at a cupboard. I opened it to find a brand new pack of filters. I got to work, and when the first pot was done, I poured us both a cup and joined her on the porch. Of all the damn luck... You know, it took me almost three weeks to find out how to stop the one I faced. It was charcoal that did it in the end, in case you were wondering. I don't think I would have lasted three weeks, I responded quietly. We just sat there, sipping our coffee and staring out at the evening sky. We'd been sitting there for an hour when I finally spoke again. Not sure what response I was expecting, I told her my plan. One of them has a meeting tomorrow. He'll be parked in an underground car park. I think I'll wait for him to show up there and hopefully catch him by surprise. Let's hope that you do, was all that she said, still staring out into the distance from the porch. I'm not sure if she was seeing the stars in the sky or something else completely. She sighed and a sad look fell upon her face. What's going on? I asked. Just hoping you're going to get through this okay. Also partly because I'm going to miss this place. But mostly I'm worried about you. I'm leaving you the farm. She said this last as if saying hello in passing. What? Really? Why? Well, I can't take it with me. The smile brightened her face once more as she spoke. I don't know what to say. Say you'll use it for good, that you'll continue the fight. Of course. I mean, I'm dead, but I can't die, so I really don't have much else to do. It was my turn to smile this time. God help us, she laughed before continuing. At least I know the world will be in good hands when I'm gone. Why do you have to go? 
It's just the way it works. When a new one takes over, it'll be your job to assist them. When they're good on their own, it's time for you to move on. It's all part of the balance. What if I'm not okay? You'll be fine, she said, laughing once again. It was a sound I knew I would miss, so I changed the subject. I'm going after the second one tomorrow, but something's been bothering me. Everyone who's heard of these guys has told me they know things. They know things they can't know. They know when things are going to happen. Yet the first one didn't see me coming. She thought about it for a moment, then shrugged her shoulders. Maybe it's bullshit. I guess we'll find out, I said, getting up and heading for the van. I looked back at her one more time and saw her wink and smile. She had told me I would be fine. She also told me to be prepared for anything. For the sake of being prepared, I made one more modification to the coffee sprayer, then dropped off the van and picked up a new car rental. When I got to the parking structure, I pulled in and found a space. After unloading the sprayer and finding a spot to hide that he would have to pass, I hunkered down and waited. If he knew I was here, I would be trapped. It was a typical underground parking garage, poorly lit with a musty, almost moldy smell. I was kneeling down between the two vehicles nearest the elevator and stairwell. Unless he walked all the way back up the ramp, he would have to pass by me, going to either the elevator or the stairs. There were stairs at the other end, but they only led up to the street for emergency use. I was an hour early, but it seemed like I had been here for three hours already. Checking the time on my cell phone proved I had been there for only 52 minutes. My legs were getting stiff from kneeling down, and I was considering standing up for a stretch when I heard a car coming. This was the third vehicle so far, and I was hoping this would be the one. Between my legs getting stiff and all the anticipation, I was getting impatient. I took a deep breath and calmed myself. I heard footsteps and my heartbeat quickened. As the person passed me, I saw it wasn't the one I was waiting for, it was the other one. Thinking that I would take advantage of him being here, I stood and approached him from behind. Just as I raised the nozzle, he spun, whipping an arm at me. His arm stretched impossibly long like a bullwhip, but longer. I hit the ground, ducking under the wild appendage. It whipped over me, missing by mere inches. I heard the screech of metal being torn apart and looked over my shoulder. The end of his arm had left a gash across the hood of one car and had gone through the fender, headlight, and all through the vehicle next to it. The appendage seemed to have ended up stuck in the radiator. I had him, and the look in his eyes said he knew it. I aimed the nozzle up at him without taking the time to stand and began spraying. The screaming and melting of flesh were expected, but there was something different this time. His entire shape began changing rapidly from form to form. At times he was animal-like in appearance, and at others his appearance was completely alien. He finally settled on a creature with three clawed toes on each foot, the legs bending backwards at the knees. The torso had ribs outside of the grayish shiny skin. The rib-like bones were a shiny silver-like chrome. There were two spikes extending up from each shoulder and out of each elbow. The hands had seven clawed fingers and two thumbs on each. The face was almost indescribable. The closest I can come to is a large head with jagged cheekbones, a hole where the nose would be, no mouth to speak of, and eyes that appeared to be made of blue flames. The next moment he disintegrated into ash. It was done. I let out a deep breath and prepared to push myself back up to my feet. Just then I felt something like a foot slam down between my shoulder blades. The spray nozzle ended up above my head and my arms were down at my sides. I had over half a tank left, but there was no way I could get to the wand to spray him. And I didn't even know yet if it was one of them. I immediately started feeling around for a button that I installed on the bottom of the tank. The person with the foot on my back finally spoke. Thank you. I was confused and could only think of asking for what? which came out in a strange squeak. For getting rid of my brothers before they finished developing their powers. It would have proved much more difficult then. I needed to stall till I could reach the button. So they didn't know I was coming, but you did? I was almost there. That's right, he responded smugly. And you didn't warn them? I continued stalling. Now why would I do that? He chuckled. My finger was on the button. They were your brothers. 
He pressed harder on my back, making it almost impossible to breathe, then responded, I was tired of sharing. I had attached a small explosive device to the tank for an emergency, and now my finger was on the button that would detonate it. This otherworldly idiot was standing on my back, slowly suffocating me. Darkness was encroaching on my vision. I knew I didn't have long. I figured this was it. And if I was going, I was taking this jackass with me. You let me kill your brothers out of greed? I wheezed. Actually, yes, he said arrogantly. You know, you're a dick. I pushed the button, splattering him with coffee, and I'm quite sure gore. We both exploded in a combination of blood and coffee, ending the last of these evil pricks. As for me, I died with a smile on my face. Okay, that's it for tonight's story. I hope everybody enjoyed. This story was written by Deimos in the Dark. That's D-E-I-M-O-S. And uh, there's a new book out by this author. It's titled Welcome to the Dark, a horror story anthology. And you can pick it up on Amazon. I'll include a link in the description below. So I hope you'll check out their work and support the author. Thanks everybody for listening. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blarian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Burt Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Windy Burns, The Windigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gemstar, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Clove Zanoya Harris, Roe Underwood, and Florida Man Luke. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos, a Discord channel, and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.